few more seconds. <laughs> give people a little bit longer. Um, so let's go again and get started. I have 12.04. Um, so I welcome everyone to the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement like the speaker series. Um, I'm Laura Holdsworth, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Shannon Wiltsey Sturman. Um, Dr. Wiltsey Sturman has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, where she led a program of study on the implementation and sustainability of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, just a couple career highlights for her are that she served on the board of directors for the American Psychological Association and also the chair of the established network of expertise for the Society of Impl for Implementation Research Collaboration. She is currently the co-lead of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Mental Health Innovation and Technology Hub at Stanford and co-developer of Pause a Moment, which is a digital well-being program for healthcare workers experiencing stress from COVID. Um, she's really a leader in the field of implementation science. I've my, admired her work for a while now, so I'm really looking forward to her presentation today. And um, so Dr. Wiltsy Sturman, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today and I appreciate everyone's um, uh, time. And I'm looking forward to telling you about um, a project that we've been working on for the past several years. Before I do that, um, because we are here at Stanford, I'm, I'm putting the link for the um, Pause a Moment program in there. Um, please do send that out to your colleagues and peers. It's really intended for um, anyone working in healthcare um, in any position who's experiencing COVID-related stressors. And we're happy to ha have rolled that out within the Stanford system and a few other uh, systems in the last couple of months. Um, so before I really get going today, it would be great to um, just for people to put in the chat the settings where you work. Um, how many of you are working in kind of a hospital-based setting? How many of you are working in clinics? How many of you are research? Um, so feel free to just type in that the settings that you're most familiar where you would be um, doing most of your work. Um, and that'll sort of help me figure out how aligned what I'm talking about is with um, some of the work that you all are doing um, in case I need to make some, um, in case I need to sort of back up and, and share a little bit of information about the settings where we were doing this work. So I see some research, some administrative settings within the hospital, patient safety. Okay, great, keep them coming. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, in the work that we were doing, um, QI approaches really were not the norm. And um, I don't know how often that uh, comes up for people who are um, kind of taking a, a QI perspective to, to problems with um, clinics and programs and hospital-based settings that they're working with. Um, but it was definitely an interesting, um, I think it was an interesting experience for the individuals who participated in the work. So first and foremost, I wanna acknowledge um, the people who participated in the study. Uh, we had funding from the Canadian Institute of Health Research and from the National Institute of Mental Health um, and had uh, a number of um, healthcare systems and collaborators um, that we couldn't have done this without. So to tell you a little bit about this project and um, the reasons for it, um, in the United States and in Canada, um, as well as in other um, settings around the world, cognitive processing therapy um, which is a trauma-focused treatment for PTSD, has been implemented um, using a pretty standard training um, approach, at least in, um, in the US and Canada and the United Kingdom, when, when there have been trainings, it's a, it's a pretty standard training and consultation approach. Um, so one of the really nice things is that we, um, we didn't have to worry about variability in the training, and we could really look at you know, given sort of a, a standard training approach, what did it look like when, we, when we'd go back a year or five years or eight or 10 years later, um, were people still doing the treatment? Um, and there's some data from the VA in the United States suggesting really um, fairly limited reach, although um, some of the most recent studies did show that we, um, that we are seeing some increases in the use of cognitive processing therapy and another treatment prolonged exposure, um, which are two guideline, um, guideline recommended treatments for PTSD. Um, and particularly when we were getting this study started, 
um, there was not a lot known about how to actually support sustained implementation. A lot of projects that were being done really focused on initial implementation. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about the treatment, it's a 12 session trauma focused treatment. Um, there have been a number of studies, over 20 randomized controlled trials in different settings. And it's a pretty focused treatment. There are 12 sessions set forth and in each session there are specific things that need to happen. And it helps people focus on emotional processing and then also addressing um, basically what people are saying to themselves about what, ha what happened, why it happened and what it means that it happened. So what we see is a lot of people blaming themselves, a lot of people saying, you know, I should have done something different. Um, you know, if only I'd been able to prevent it or avoid it or do something different, or if I'd fought back or um, I should have known it was happening. I never should have gone out that day. So a lot of the work that we do is help people um, look at those types of things that they're saying to themselves and, and process their reactions to the trauma. And it, as I mentioned, it's been implemented um, in a number of mental health systems. And um, there was a framework that came out several years ago, right around the time we were applying for this grant um, that suggested that in the settings where we work, change is, is really the norm. And that if we wanna be able to sustain interventions, we need to be able to adapt um, to the changes in the context. And in mental health settings, that can look like, you know, in the VA for a number of years, we were seeing World War II veterans, Korea War veterans, Vietnam veterans. And now all of a sudden we had a much younger, younger demographic of veterans coming in um, from the more recent wars and conflicts. Um, in community settings, that might look like um, an agency that's been working primarily with youth and families um, gets a contract to work with um, a large refugee population that's, um, that's coming into the area. And so as these changes happen, um, we need to sometimes adapt our treatments and approaches. Um, we might need to adapt our outreach um, and we might actually also need to adapt, make some adaptations to the context. And one of the recommendations was to use these cycles of change that we're so familiar with in quality improvement, the plan, do, study, act cycle. So we really, um, you know, we can't do a new randomized control trial every time we need to adapt a treatment. Um, we, um, so using these more QI approaches, we can um, test whether the changes we're making are having, um, would point it, would suggest that we're having the desired impact. So we, um, we got NIH funding and um, CIHR funding to look at different strategies to kind of apply this framework um, and compare strategies to improve and sustain the use of cognitive processing therapy. So help support fidelity, even improve fidelity where we need to. And we decided to compare two learning collaborative approaches. Um, one was a fidelity oriented approach and the other was a continuous quality improvement oriented. And we were looking at PTSD outcomes, fidelity to CPT, whether people were doing the protocol the way it was described, um, how people adapted it, uh, capacity, whether we saw an increase in capacity of providers who could uh, provide CPT, and then costs. Um, and so today I'm gonna tell you mostly about the project and I'll tell you about some preliminary insights and some very preliminary findings. We're just finalizing the data collection now. Um, but this was a study that we did in the US and Canada. Um, it was a cluster randomized control trial to one of these two learning collaborative approaches. And we chose learning collaborative approaches because they had been used in implementation of some trauma-focused treatments more for children. Um, and we also um, saw the literature on the breakthrough uh, collaborative approach. Um, so learning collaborative seemed like a good way for people to work within and across their own systems and networks and clinics to share information about what was working, to enact these tests of change, to, to, um, and to, um, to work with sort of experts and people who could help facilitate at a local level, um, but also share information across. And we collected a lot of data, including audio of therapy sessions, clinical notes and worksheets, activity reports that the therapist provided, interviews, um, some surveys of organizational and individual characteristics. And then for those in the CQI group where we were using the plan, do, study, act um, process, we also collected um, all of the PDSAs. 
So I'll tell you a little bit more about these two approaches and why we chose them in a moment. Um, but unlike um, some of the more traditional learning collaboratives where people came together in person and had you know maybe three days of training in QI approaches and then went back, um, worked on their plan, came back together again in person, um, we knew that this wasn't going to work in some of the systems we were working in, including the VA, um, just with some of the constraints around travel. Um, and then it's really fortunate because once we launched the study a few years in, we also um, ran into COVID. So this was already designed to be entirely virtual um, with platforms that had um, a number of different support materials and things that people could access. Um, it was a cluster randomized control trial. Um, we aimed to have 32 clinics, about 120 clinicians, and we asked them to each to enroll between four and six patients. Um, we used a mixed methods approach. Um, we had initially um, tapped three systems. We ended up um, working with more systems. So um, we wanted to have a better understanding of the different contextual factors. Um, so we used interviews, uh, we coded the meetings, some of the meetings um, and are continuing to code and, and use session reports from the different learning collaborative meetings. Um, we wanted to identify barriers and facilitators um, and information on the organizational context. Um, and we used the consolidated framework for implementation research. So we wanted to look at the reach or penetration um, and our hypotheses really, when we looked at the literature pointed us in different directions. So for some things, we thought that the continuous quality improvement approach might give us better results. For others, we thought the fidelity approach might. So for example, for fidelity, <laughs> if the entire goal of your learning collaborative is to help support people um, doing the treatment well, um, tailoring it appropriately for their clients, building their skills, um, then you know, we, we assumed that that learning collaborative approach would be a better fit. Um, but for things like reach, we, um, we thought that the CQI approach would be a better fit um, because we, we intended to use the CQI approach to really help address barriers to just basic things like getting people into sessions. Um, for costs, um, the CQI approach, um, we plan to do a budget impact analysis. We thought CQI might have some cost benefits. We still haven't looked at that yet. Um, capacity building, we thought that for provider status, for the people that had um, uh, were able to sort of achieve the, um, they already needed to be CPT providers, most of them. But what we found is that in some programs, people had gotten some of the training, but hadn't finished the training and they were still doing the treatment. So we thought we'd capacity for um, provider status, but the, the CQI approach might actually have some advantages for be addressing organization level challenges. Um, similarly, we thought we'd see improvements on implementation climate for the CQI approach, um, but for fidelity, based on the existing literature suggested that fidelity for cognitive processing therapy was associated with better outcomes, um, we thought that the fidelity approach might give us better um, clinical outcomes, although we were, um, we, it was really a toss up. We weren't sure because the CQI approach would have advantages there as well. Um, so. We ended up recruiting 44 clinics um, in Canada and um, in VAs. We actually had an additional VA that, um, that was willing to do the study, but then when it came time to enroll, we did not get clinicians enrolled. And we had some clinics in, in Texas enrolled as well because the state of Texas had implemented cognitive processing therapy as well. We ended up with um, 150 clinicians um, and just about achieved our, our uh, patient goal. We have some that are still in their second year follow-up and they're still enrolling. So we think we'll hit our target there. Um, so the, th the therapist, and I say therapists, these were really the, the folks in the learning collaboratives were therapists and their program level supervisors um, who were also licensed clinicians and did some practice but had some time cleared for the administration and, and um, supporting the programs. Um, so um, this was our population of or our sample of therapists. Um, our clients so far um, were um, really reflecting that well, a lot of them came from Canada, which in many of the areas where we were working were a little bit less diverse. But um, at this point, this was the data. Some of the unknown, we are collecting additional data, so we'll have more, more data there. Um, just for baseline, we collected some um, 
some demographics, some reach data. Um, we collected data, uh, the evidence-based practice attitude scale, perceived characteristics of the innovation. Um, so these were kind of clinician perceptions and attitudes. At the clinic level, uh, we looked at learning organization, the learning organization survey, implementation climate, implementation leadership, and the organizational social context. And to get some of the outcomes, we, um, we use the fidelity rating scale that's been used in CPT clinical trials. Um, we had raters trained to achieve agreement and they, they selected that we had randomly selected sessions from different time points. So the therapists um, turned in every session for clients who they enrolled and we had audio and we reviewed a sampling of those randomly selected from uh, four time points in the first year and then additional time points in the second year. Um, so I'm going to show you the baseline data first because it's pretty interesting in that this was between one and eight years after the clinicians had gotten trained. So this gave us a good opportunity to see what happens after training if the system just does whatever the system had in place to support um, CPT and evidence-based practices, which did vary somewhat by systems. Um, the, uh, the VA had clinical templates. Um, they had, um, at least in theory, they had, um, they had a, well, they had a, a requirement that CPT and PE, prolonged exposure, be available in every facility um, and that therapists needed to have protected time to get through the training. So there were some policy level um, things in place to support it. Other programs had the training and not much else or other systems. So in the USBA, um, you can see that on average, they, they really got started with CPT first. So they were four or five years out from their trainings. In Canada and the uh, community settings, they were a little over a year out. And in the operational stress injury clinics um, and the Canadian forces clinics, they were about two years out. Um, so first we wanted to look at reach. How many people, what proportion of eligible individuals actually uh, got CPT? And you can see that it was um, highest in um, PTSD clinical teams in the VA um, in the United States. And then um, and the, next, the next highest was actually community mental health, um, community mental health settings and private practices in Canada. Um, we didn't see significant differences across them, but you can see that the Canadian forces and operational stress injury clinics were somewhat lower, um, which leads to some of the findings I'll show you on the next slide. But the fidelity, um, it looked like there was some um, room for improvement, but no differences across the systems um, a few years out. So the training seemed to have a, a similar impact in terms of fidelity across the different systems. And um, the, the skill or competence scale goes up to a six and what we were seeing as a range um, really kind of hovering around a three. So there was room for improvement, both for adherence, whether people did all of the elements that were required um, for the treatment, and then also the skill level. Um, so a few things that we saw that were predictors that suggested that we might be on the right track with the um, two approaches that we compared. First of all, for REACH, so this is the proportion of um, eligible patients who got the treatment. Having gotten consultation was associated with higher REACH. In, um, in, a, in one of the systems, they did a trial where they looked at whether consultation was really necessary. Um, and um, one of the findings was that the patient outcomes were actually better when people got consultation after they did the initial training. Um, but also we could see that you know, between one and, and five or six years out, we were still seeing higher reach. Um, we also saw that in, um, in community settings, um, we saw higher reach than in the VA settings. And for, for whatever reason, we still haven't figured this out, but the male therapists um, had higher reach. Um, I don't know if they were offering it to more of their patients or patients were more likely to accept it from um, male clinicians who, who offered cognitive processing therapy, but that was one of the findings. Also, not surprisingly, the longer people had gone since their training, um, we saw a marginal association with lower levels of adherence. So people started to deviate or, or drift away from the protocol a little more. Um, but we also saw that if they received all of the consultation, um, if they didn't drop out of consultation and they weren't in that study condition where they didn't get it, um, that, they, um, that we were seeing higher competence even a year or more later. 
So based on some of these findings, you know, we saw some challenges that might be more organizationally related um, when we did some of our, our baseline work and some of our preliminary work. We also saw that there really did seem to be some importance around consultation. Um, so we decided to compare to use a learning collaborative format, and it was based on the breakthrough series collaborative model um, that really emphasizes adult learning principles, interactive training, um, skills focused training. Um, oh, and um, we needed this to be lighter and lighter touch, unlike initial implementation efforts where um, you know, the systems hadn't put anything in the, into place, including even supporting training. These were systems that all invested in some way in getting people trained and creating some policy. Um, and so we wanted to see whether for sustainment, we needed the, you know, something we could get away with something a little bit lighter touch and more feasible um, that didn't require the travel that could all be done virtually. So what we did were some initial meetings um, for the first month we had, um, bi-weekly meetings, and then we transitioned to monthly meetings um, with correspondence and activity in between. The initial meetings provided some training um, for the uh, CQI approach. We did initial training in some of the, the QI principles. Um, and then we also um, provided some refresher, some, some materials for people to get a little refresher in CPT. Um, and, then the, and then the meetings really moved to monthly with the idea being that people would work on their plans in between. Um, so for the fidelity oriented group, we were focusing on helping them improve or maintain fidelity to CPT, building skill, and then also addressing clinical challenges in a manner that was consistent with the treatment. And the fidelity oriented included some, um, some learning sessions um, during the, the meetings where people could um, get some, uh, get some guidance around specific issues that they were having challenges from. The facilitator would provide some training, um, some consultation, they would get modeling, and they could also get some feedback. Um, if not on full audio of sessions, they could play segments. Um, they could get feedback on worksheets that were done in the sessions. Um, and so there were ways for them to get some guidance on specific cases, as well as some broader training. Um, so it was run by a facilitator who had expertise in CPT. Um, they reviewed key skills. They talked about what the barriers were to uh, fidelity. And based on that, they would have some didactics. Um, they could review work samples. Um, and there was also message board contact so that people could uh, communicate between meetings, especially since they were only biweekly or monthly since people had already had the full training. Um, if people needed some guidance or some input in between, they could use the message board. And this is just um, what some of the message boards look like, some of the different um, things that people, um, these were, we, are, we had a section that was all posts by study coordinators or me so that we could keep everybody um, be identified. Um, and these are all um, facilitators that you see here. But we had different, um, different cohorts. We also had a, a, a fidelity, like a, a cohort wide um, so that if people wanted to ask questions of their peers and other learning collaborative groups, there could be learning across conditions as well. Um, and then we also provided them with a lot of resources. Some of these did transition over to the study website, um, but we had whiteboard videos with key concepts from CPT. And this was available, by the way, to both conditions. Um, the, the CPT materials, the CQI materials were only um, available to folks in the CQI learning collaborative. We also had um, webinars. Um, Every quarter, we would have a webinar throughout the study. So um, we had some different topics that would be of interest, more from a clinical perspective. And then the CQI-oriented group was um, focused on using the quality improvement process to, um, uh, to really help people with barriers that they experienced um, and challenges. So we used, um, as one of our key um, strategies, the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. Um, to address barriers either at the clinic, organizational, um, therapist, or client level, or at the level of the treatment, if the treatment, if there were indicators that it might need to be adapted for some reason. So we would help people set goals. They were, um, we did give them feedback, some data on reach, on some of the organizational characteristics, um, their scores on things like implementation climate for evidence-based treatments. 
And then based on what they really identified as their key barriers, we use these plan to study act cycles. Um, and they had the same meeting schedule, they had access to the same types of message boards, but for the CQI cohort, and then also um, they had the, the resources for CPT. So um, this is probably a group that's more familiar with the PDSA cycles than some groups, but um, you know, plan. Um, so what do we need to do? What do we think um, will make a difference? You can, we, we had people do the industry search, also sort of more local um, guidance, guidance from the literature. Um, what's what we, we lay out a plan to carry that out. We carry it out. Um, we collect the data that we needed to see if it had worked, and then we would um, have another cycle and, and really refine if we needed to. Um, and this is just a, a couple of examples of the PDSA worksheets. So um, one of the barriers in, in private practice is that for people with private insurance, they only got four sessions of therapy. And so for people to get a full course of CPT, they were going to need to um, advocate you know, with the, um, with the provi insurance providers to increase the number of sessions. So this was something where a group worked together to um, develop a, a, you know, get some findings on CPT, effectiveness, get a letter drafted that could be a template that they could use, um, provide input, send it out, and then track the responses. Um, another was around um, someone who was wanting to actually increase reach um, in their clinic or a clinic, but they had a lot of people who were eligible but not really sure. So they wanted to use some motivational interviewing to try to increase readiness. Um, so you can see this is just a sample of the plan. Now, in our, in our calls, we would sometimes have people, um, they couldn't necessarily work through the whole plan, obviously, in a one-month cycle. So we would use our calls to sort of troubleshoot and figure out where people were in the plans. Um, and so just to tell you, I guess a few things that we, um, that we learned, the data are still coming in. We have all of our year one data and a good bit of our year two. So we're starting to look at our year one data, which is really the active learning collaborative phase. Um, one of the things that we um, that our preliminary data tell us is that, as expected, the fidelity oriented learning collaboratives did look like it was associated with at least higher adherence over the course of that whole year. Um, and also, interestingly, even though we were trying to increase reach, at least in terms of getting people enrolled in the study, the CQI oriented therapists seemed to enroll fewer people. Um, now, whether that's um, going to translate to lower reach in general, or if it's just that maybe because they weren't getting direct consultation on specific cases, they had a little bit less uh, motivation to enroll individuals, um, or if there was something else going on, you know, we're, we're still trying to look at our qualitative data and look at the calls and things to try to understand that. Um, another thing that we learned is, um, you know, mental health is um, not, we don't see CQI used as often in, in mental health as I think we do in some other settings, um, quality improvement approaches. So it was less familiar to these groups. And many of them came in really wanting consultation. They wanted to talk about cases that they were having challenges with. And so one of the things that the CQI facilitators needed to do is say, well, let's take this up a level. Do you have, do you have challenges with a lot of people no showing? Um, you know, rather than this one client who keeps no showing when you're trying to do CPT with them, is this a big issue more broadly? And then we would try to help them as a clinic or a program figure out what to do when they had people um, no showing frequently, you know, how to come up with systems to remind people to shore up, shore up motivation, um, to, you know, maybe have reminder calls to get people scheduled in slots where they were less likely to, you know, wasn't too early in the morning or they were going to hit traffic, for example. So, um, so we would try to take these individual challenges that people seemed more comfortable coming in and talking about and making it a broader issue that, you know, we see this a lot for this kind of treatment, that it's hard to get enough weekly therapy slots um, opened up from your clinic so that you can schedule people in so they, you know, they can be seen once a week. So let's work at that at a clinic level. And the CQI plans would try to focus around those issues. Um, and, but also despite providing feedback on things like organization level data and reach, um, it didn't really have a lot of impact on what people prioritized. Very often what the, the therapist and even the kind of the clinical supervisor um, were focused on other than some of these issues around reach and helping more people get into treatment tended to be around these clinical level challenges. And so we use the CQI approach but that is often not how CQI is used. So it's gonna be interesting to see if it has the impact that, that we hope. 
And we really tried to work with people on, you know, making sure they had some data each, each call to really inform, are we on the right track with this plan? You know, around um, having people, you know, do more of the exercises and the, you know, between sessions that CPT requires or, you know, reducing our no-shows um, or, you know, helping make, make sure that people actually do get in for treatment weekly. Um, and so I think those are some of the things. So it'll be very interesting to see how this lighter touch application in systems that already invested in implementing CPT actually works out in terms of, um, in terms of um, you know, increasing things like um, fidelity, clinical outcomes, and reach, which I think are three of the key things that we want to look at. And I think that the mixed methods approach is really going to help us understand um, and look under the hood around um, what we're finding and what we'll be finding in terms of our, our primary outcomes. So um, we'll be using a CNA coincidence analysis to really look at whether there are different combinations of factors that seem to lead to different um, types of outcomes within these programs. And um, so we're really looking forward to connecting both our qualitative and quantitative data um, to get some insight into how this worked um, and, and what it was like for clinicians who I'll say on the fidelity side, they were much more comfortable. They, they, it looked much more like what they had gotten when they were initially training with the treatment. And it was more around case conceptualization discussion, seemed much more comfortable. And so it'll be interesting to see um, whether and what type of impact CQI had. Um, and we have some interviews with clinicians that can help us understand that as well. And so with that, I think um, I've, I've talked through a lot of the lessons learned, but um, you know, what's been interesting is just to see um, that these different formats might have different impacts on some of the different goals that we had. Um, and um, we found both individual and organizational level barriers that might suggest that running two tracks where therapists are getting consultation and there's kind of this more QI um, approach, which is how it's been done in, in some of these initial implementation efforts, um, might be indicated, although then we've got to look at uh, trade-offs with costs. And, um, but it could be the case that at the clinic level, you know, the clinic manager is more focused on things that the clinicians really aren't. And the clinicians want guidance and help and support around working with their cases but from the ground up that they're not necessarily, even when they're fed back some of the, the data and information, um, that they might be um, more likely to sort of see, see what the key challenges are at a different level than, than their supervisors. Um, it was very interesting. We, we'd send people away from these meetings with a written or updated PDSA um, in CQI, but sometimes when they came back, even though we got we sent reminders and nudges to, to be collecting and looking at their the data and between sessions or feeding them back some of the information, they came back and it, it sometimes seemed like um, even when they had the written plan that they were kind of taking what they remembered from the meeting and trying to apply it in a less systematic way. So we really worked with them on that as well and even had them pinning up their, you know, their PDSI cycles someplace where they could see it. Um, some plans could be executed as teams, others um, clinicians really wanted to work at an individual level on, on challenges that they were experiencing in using CPT. Um, CQI is, is generally, of course, used for teams, so whether the more individual approaches could be used um, would be helpful. And then um, during COVID, some of the plans were around transitioning to telehealth, which is a, a potentially a, a good use for QI that might have come at the right time for these groups. Um, so I think what we're really looking forward to is um, learning from our data when light touch is sufficient and when you might need something more intensive um, as well and looking at the costs and benefits of each. So with that, I'd like to just um, turn it over and open it up to questions um, and uh, you know, questions, comments, and, and just um, hear from you all. Well, thank you. Um, that was such a wonderful talk. I have a bunch of questions myself, but um, so if anybody would like to, um, you can ask your questions in the chat and I can read them or um, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to call on you. Um, but um, I'll go ahead and start with, with one of mine um, about the, I thought was really interesting is actually comparing different types of learning collaboratives as implementation strategies, right? That's not something I think I've really seen before. Um, and this might be in your qualitative data, which I think you said you're still analyzing, but was there any sense whether the therapists, you know, people liked the, um, the fidelity approach more than the CQI approach? It sounded like the CQI was perhaps more challenging because people were also learning an additional skill of just doing quality improvement. 
Um, but with, do you have any sense yet or that in your data? And also um, their reflections on the virtual versus an in-person format and whether you know you would kind of do that again or you know were there was there anything missing from not having any in-person contact? Yeah, yeah. Those are both <clears throat> yeah, good questions. It's very interesting from interviewing our learning collaborative facilitators as well as our um, you know, from what we can tell from the interviews with the, the um, participants, um, some groups, some CQI groups really just ran with it. They, they, they got it, they liked it, they worked together as teams or, and some of them even had individual level PDSAs that they were working on and ones that they worked on as teams. Um, and they just really, something clicked and they liked it. Um, and, um, and especially sometimes they would even figure out that they didn't even have to get all the way through all the steps in their plan before they started to see change. And that was reinforcing. For other groups, it, it felt like it kind of limped along and, and that they were pulling more for consultation um, and more what they would get over on the fidelity side. Um, and, you know, and, and we had to really kind of pull them back towards, well, we're going to try to, you know, we're going to try to use this plan, but the great thing is you're going to get a written plan when you, you know, leave this meeting, you know, and, and we'll be able to work together on it to see if it works, you know, unlike in consultation where you get some advice, maybe you apply it and you go back in, in a month and, you know, or use the message board. Um, it really seemed variable um, is what I can tell you so far. And so I'll be interested in at least taking a look at, at some of the data. Um, I think we'll have to think of the metric, you know, where we where we sort of split the teams, but but it might be, um, you know, the the learning the CQI group that actually maybe completed more of their um, PDSAs or that made more progress or something, and see if the outcomes differ when they really engaged in the process versus when it felt like the facilitator was kind of pulling them along. And we had someone who had done uh, learning collaboratives in um, in mental health before. And she was saying, you know, if you can get them to write up the plan themselves instead of you doing it when you screen share, like that might help them take more ownership. Um, and it just didn't happen <laughs> in some groups. You know, they just, if we didn't write it up and send it to them, um, it probably was not going to get written up. Um, and so I, I do think that engagement and the learning collaborative is going to be an important variable for us to look at when we're looking at the effectiveness. Um, and, and whether the groups that really sort of embraced it and worked through their plans look different than, than the ones that don't in terms of their outcomes. Yeah, so that's super interesting. So follow up on engagement then, how are you gonna be able to measure that? Do you have like quantitative measures or is it gonna be qualitative? You know, how do you, how do you decide the kind of, um, you know, whether you say, well, you know, this is what good engagement looks like and this is what, you know, Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. So we um, we had the facilitators do a report after every meeting um, and they, you know, it had attendance. So that'll just be a basic thing, um, as well as who really actually participated versus who, you know, just sort of listened or, or you know, really didn't talk very much. Um, so we can kind of look at just, you know, engagement that way. Um, we can also look at percent of plans. We had the facilitator kind of estimate how, what proportion of the plans had been done each call and um, and then we also have, you know, we kept all of the plans so we know which ones were sort of completed, whether they were closed out because we didn't need to work through all the steps because they got where they needed to, or, um, you know, they got all the way through it. Um, so we can also look at kind of engagement and completion of plans, you know, whether there were some groups that just, you know, started plans, never finished them versus groups that seem to be kind of actively working and making progress each time. So I think that'll be an important one as well. And then on the on the fidelity side, it was similar. We had the, the facilitators check off for both groups, how engaged they seem to be both in the CPT and the CQI or the learning collaborative process as well. Great, well, I, I do have another question, which I can keep going with um, unless anybody else has any others. Um, but you mentioned the impact of COVID and I don't know if you had a crystal ball that you kind of saw the future and so picked the virtual format for the learning collaboratives, which worked out well. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the impact of COVID um, on either, you know, therapist participation in the collaborative or, you know, their, whether their priorities shifted at all based on where they were. You had Canada and the US, like you know, a lot of different places. I wonder if you can talk about that and, and whether, you know, what the impact was and maybe how you captured changes um, that happened during that time, you know, what kind of way did you go about doing that? 
Yeah, so we definitely used the reports, um, the facilitator reports to help us um, understand what was going on during that time, what challenges they were bringing up, if there were new COVID related challenges. Um, we did have one learning collaborative um, basically just, I mean, it folded almost as soon as it started because that was right when COVID hit and they all just said, we can't participate anymore. <laughs> like we just, you know, um, and um, and some did say that telehealth was a big challenge and they, that they really wanted to work on, you know, using the process to convert to telehealth. And I think in both conditions, you know, over on the fidelity condition, they were probably doing more like, well, how do you do worksheets and share screens and, you know, do all those things that you would be doing in in-person therapy. We did some of that over on the CQI side as well. And our teams just sort of stopped and compiled resources as well. Like that's just one of the things we did is, you know, got as much as we could out there on telehealth for them. And um, we had some webinars on using, um, you know, doing CPT over telehealth. Fortunately, we had uh, good data that CPT could be done virtually. Um, and, and we had um, a lot of experience and lessons learned in the CPT community around that. Um, so we were able to sort of share that information. It definitely helped, you know, that we didn't have to try to move something from an in-person setting to virtual. One of the reasons that everything was virtual is the study was, you know, um, you know, all over North America. And um, so all of our data collection was going to be virtual anyway. But we also knew that trying to, you know, we couldn't really sustain a travel budget on the grant. Um, and we, we knew that some of the settings just wouldn't have supported it. So um, I think that there definitely are things that you can lose from um, in person. For example, the, that kind of um, normalization, like, oh, look, I'll, here are all these other places working on these things and, and they're all doing QI as well. And, you know, oh, let's catch some of the excitement. And we really tried to use the message board and, and sort of share information. One of the things that we also did, since we didn't have those in person um, or those, those regular meetings, is we um, had a, um, we had, when we knew that, that a group had a challenge, um, that they were wanting to apply a QI approach, we did start to say, well, let's look in our bank of, of plans to see if another group's worked on this and see what they have. So we'd use the message boards, but we would also use the old plans and they always had to be adapted, but it was a way of creating a sense of, you know, other people are working on this too. And sometimes we'd say, hey, why don't we reach out to the other groups? Um, it definitely wasn't the same, um, but there were some ways that we tried to, to get some of that um, cross, you know, sort of cross-pollination, um, you know, within the, the broader learning collaborative cohorts. Um, and I see, Katie, you had your hand up and I see something in the chat too. Do you, do you want to just ask or I can kind of read through some of this as well? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I, I just was curious, um, I'd love to hear more about any, any shifts or any resistance to shifts from thinking kind of at the client specific level to, to sort of the level up of like what's happening across the board. And you talked about this a little bit already, but, um, but I, I just am, I'm super interested both in how this transition happens and what facilitates it um, and and when it's a good thing that that is useful and and when um, you know when clinicians really need to or want to stay in the client focused space. Yeah, um, that's a really I mean it's a really good question um, and it is something we struggled with because that's one of the things that I think we found is that you know, people were very invested in, in doing this in their practice with their individual clients. And for some people, it was very frustrating, for example, that they didn't have more sessions set aside, weekly sessions set aside for EBPs. And they could recognize that maybe that was a more clinic level issue that needed to be addressed and, you know, our program level. And so we did get some investment around those types of things. But, um, but I think, yeah, a lot of it, that, that mindset shift, like I said, some groups really got it and they kind of ran with it and they could say, oh, look, okay, we're all going to kind of pool our data together and see, you know, what happens when we start doing reminder calls or when we get people, you know, um, using the CPT text app to um, schedule reminders for their homework and for their sessions and, you know, all of those types of things. Um, and, and let's see, you know, I've got four clients I'm doing that with and you've got three and, and we'll pool our data and start to see if it's actually working. Some groups could really do that. Others, um, I think they they were really focused on kind of the challenges that were right in front of them. 
And to the extent that we could broaden it and say, oh, you know, other people in this group are, are having this issue as well. Um, let's try to work a little more systematically about this. You know, um, we, we sort of described the CQI approach or the PSA approach as systematic trial and error. And one of the things we did when we oriented them is we said, you know, we do this all the time. Every time you try a new route for work, every time you try to figure out if your plant should be in the window or in the shade, you know, you're, you're using this approach. You just don't realize it. Um, so we were trying to sort of say, and you use this with your clients too, if you're looking at their symptom measures and trying to figure out if they're, if they're doing better or not, and then adjusting your practice based on that. So we tried to help them, you know, think of this as this is something you already do. I don't know that we were always successful in some of the groups. Some got it and liked that idea and others just really wanted to kind of stay more focused on, you know, and, and they would say, well, part of their goal was as an individual clinician, they wanted to get better at doing their treatment. And we would say, well, that's great. You can make that a goal. We can make that PDSAs. You know, we can do PDSAs around that and think about how to, to work on this, you know, to, to work on this more systematically rather than kind of getting consultation and applying what you're learning, you know, more broadly where, you know, where are the, the specific areas where you, you as a group or as individuals might have some challenges and let's kind of use this process around it. Um, but for some groups, it, it still just felt like they were coming away and they'd, they'd take what we put in the plan, but they'd almost take it as advice and they'd forget that there was the written plan. And they'd say, oh yeah, I did some of that. We did, we did, yeah, I did a couple of those. I did, oh, I did step three, <laughs> you know. Um, and um, so it really varied. Um, and, I, and I think that it, it, it might be partially because QI is just not something that we tend to do in the same way in mental health. Um, you know, in, in the VA now with modeling to learn, I think in some of those programs that are really doing it, they're getting the sense of like, let's look at our data and come up with a plan. But that is, it's really a shift in terms of the way that, um, that these programs tend to work. So it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm really curious to look more at the qualitative data and to code some of the, the plans and things to see, um, you know, to try to actually um, get a little bit, a little more texture around these groups that really ran with it and, you know, what they liked about it and, and how they were able to make that shift. Awesome, thank well, you. Yeah, that, that's, that's super helpful and I think, Super interesting to keep in mind as we move in healthcare more towards quality improvement kind of across the board, knowing, you know, how, how and when to make that shift and how to support people and thinking that way is, is just going to be really useful. Yeah, so definitely sort of an intervention in its own right, right? Um, well, well great. And, yeah, just a, just a thing to add is, you know, on some level, and, and I see this often with implementation strategies is, you know, in some ways we're trying to, you know, they were already working on implementing CPT and now we're trying to sort of implement a whole other approach with them, right? <laughs> and, you know, whenever you have an implementation strategy that, it is, that itself has to get implemented, you've got a little bit more of a lift potentially, um, although that might be what it takes and when you get the buy-in, it can work really well. Yeah. Great points. Well, um, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I won't subject everybody to, to more of my questions, which I feel like uh, there's some self-interested ones at this point. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Wilty Sturman. It's been a really great talk and I will let everybody have a few more minutes um, left in their day. So thank yeah, you. Thank you all for having me today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.